Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Meyer. I'm the Director of Development for the Department of Neurosurgery. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that we find you all safe and well. This is your first time joining us for Fridays with Freelander. We've covered many remarkable topics by incredible expert UPMC and University of Pittsburgh neurosurgeons, researchers, and current and former trainees. If you missed any of our past presentations and would like to view them, please visit the dedicated Fridays with Freelander page on our department website at www.neurosurgery.pit.edu. All of our attendees' mics are muted, but you can type a question in the Q&A chat box. And we'll try to get to as many as we can in our allotted time. If you have any questions after today's event, or if you watch the you're watching the recorded version and have questions or comments, please email me at jrm233 at pit.edu. This week, we're highlighting one of our extraordinary assistant professors of neurosurgery, Dr. Marco Capogrosso. Thank you for being here with us today, Dr. Capogrosso. As for that, Dr. Friedlander, thank you, and please take it away. Well, thank you very much, uh, Justin, and again, a pleasure to be here with all of you uh, today. Uh, again, as I usually do, I'd like to provide a little bit of uh, uh, feedback and uh, background on where we are with the uh, COVID uh, pandemic and situation uh, currently within our hospitals and in our cities. Uh, and then I will say a few words about uh, Dr. Capogrosso. Um, situation uh, has changed since uh, the last time we were uh, together a few weeks ago, where uh, the number of uh, COVID uh, uh, cases and uh, patients uh, in the hospital are significantly uh, increasing uh, day by day. We're saying we got a log of the number of uh, patients, patients in the ICU, patients who are being ventilated, and patients that are fortunately are passing away uh, with, uh, with a COVID uh, infection. And uh, to me, I, yeah, I wanna make the plea to everybody that, uh, that can, and I, I think just about everybody should be able to get vaccinated because the difference is, is uh, remarkable. People that are uh, vaccinated, uh, you know, people do get uh, COVID, uh, particularly with, this, uh, with the Delta variant, but the number of people that end up getting admitted, the people that are in an ICU intubated and dying is uh, almost exclusively people who are not uh, vaccinated. So it really is a disease of the non-vaccinated uh, patients. And you know, non-vaccinated uh, patients are more likely to carry more of, uh, of the disease, more of this uh, virus as a larger viral reservoir. And the more replicating viruses that there are out there, the more likely that it is to change and become more vir virulent and uh, dangerous uh, to the population. So I see it as a matter of um, both social responsibility uh, to to do this and to assist uh, society um, really try to get through uh, with the virus. It's uh, you know we don't want to go back to where we were on lockdowns and uh, and uh, and not being able to do many of the things that we're able to do now, but in part also the, the transmission of the virus is because we're out, out and about uh, more towards a normalcy, obviously not 100% normal, but more towards normalcy than we were at the heights of uh, the pandemic. So I really I implore everybody uh, who has not been vaccinated uh, to get vaccinated, and I'm sure the people that have been vaccinated uh, when it's time to get their boosters uh, to to do so, and I know that they will because it's a uh, looks like a, a dichotomy in, in, in philosophy and in, in the individuals, people that want to be vaccinated and feel more safe uh, out there. So again, I implore you to do that. The other part is, again, um, making sure that everybody knows our hospitals are very, very safe. And if anybody needs to go to the doctor to make sure that at least contact your doctor, that we're doing a lot of visits uh, via telemedicine, so patients don't actually have to come uh, to the hospital at times. I mean, the things that obviously they do need to come uh, to the hospital. So again, uh, please, uh, if you have any issues, any questions, make sure to call your doctor and come to the hospital if uh, you need uh, to do so. We really don't want to see this uh, pandemic uh, getting uh, worse and worse in the United States where we have uh, so many, uh, so much availability of uh, the vaccine. So with that, with that said, um, you know, one of the uh, um, most fun things of my job is to be able to uh, recruit uh, people to our department that uh, that I I like personally, that uh, I believe in the work that uh, that uh, they do. And uh, a couple of years ago, 
I had the opportunity to recruit our next speaker, Dr. Marco Capogrosso, really a, a remarkable individual doing remarkable uh, research. This is the kind of work that uh, we'll be seeing. We we'll see it today, but we'll see it in five or 10 years that it's one of these um, uh, studies that really has transformed what uh, we do. And uh, again, he's a remarkable individual. Uh, he works with his wife uh, as well, who's got an own independent laboratory, and 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 she's doing some exceptional uh, work uh, as well. And I'm sure you're all going to be very impressed and excited to see what uh, what he'll show you today. So, Dr. Capogrosso, thanks for joining us, and uh, please take it away. Thanks so much, Robert, for the introduction. We, as you know, uh, we couldn't do this without your continuous support and, and scientific contribution to all this project. So a public thank you um, on this channel. Um, so uh, I want to present some data of which actually Dr. Freelander was pretty excited about and, um, and uh, we participated together in this trial. Um, and it, this, it, 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 I will describe the latest advancement of um, a research program uh, on the development of new neurotechnologies uh, that are meant to treat uh, arm and hand paralysis. Uh, just a brief disclosure um, before in the videos, uh, in the following slide, there will be one video with the monkey experiments. So if you are particularly sensitive to these things, you may want to skip that. So I'm talking about uh, uh, paralysis, but I wanted to start um, uh, describing what stroke is. Uh, this is because stroke, in fact, although when we discuss about paralysis, we immediately think about spinal cord injury or ALS, for example. In fact, it turns out that stroke is the first cause of paralysis in the United States. Uh, this is a picture of a stroke, is an infarct in, near the region of the internal capsule that causes severe motor symptoms. Uh, it is so common, in fact, that uh, uh, almost 800,000 uh, patients per year suffer, um, suffer from stroke. And uh, about half um, of those uh, remain permanently with permanent motor deficits, specifically of the arm and hand. Uh, this is a very devastated condition for which there is no effective clinical therapy. I mean, right now, uh, except from the uh, immediate care that we can give, and it is actually pretty successful, when the subject reaches the, the chronic phase of those 400,000 new people every year just in the US, uh, there's not much we can do. There is physical therapy, but it's not very effective. And so this leads to uh, a total of $46 billion spent per year for direct and indirect cost of care. Why do I want to, to give you this number? It's not about just the money. It's about the fact that within this money, there is the money that the people affected by stroke lose because they have to skip their jobs because they can't work anymore. And so their caregivers who often are family members. So it's a very, very high burden uh, for modern societies. Um, so how does the stroke look like? Um, normally um, there's, there's a high variety, but the most severe stroke, we have this typical flex uh, arm and hand posture. Uh, the, the shoulder is uh, it's depressed uh, and um, the arm is flexed and the hand is essentially paralyzed. There is no mobility almost at all. So obviously that leads to a reduced independence. Uh, people need assistance for every type of life needs, which takes a burden also on the primary caregiver, uh, like I said. And eventually, obviously reduce the quality of life um, uh, also because uh, this reduced function degrades the social particip participation and so psychological health uh, of the subject affected by stroke. And, and, and then finally, it leads to a loss of income because of the impossibility of do, of do everyday jobs once your arm and hand is paralyzed. So the big question here, and it's one of the dreams of humanity, is whether we can fix paralysis at all. I mean, what can we do? There's so many new technology and so many treatments that could be available. And in fact, in the last years, uh, uh, a particular technology known as epidural spinal cord stimulation has emerged uh, as a potential treatment for paralysis. In fact, this is a pretty old technology. It's around uh, in the US since the 70s. Uh, it, it concerns the placement of a stimulator just between your vertebral bones and the spinal cord, and that recruits the sensory afferents, the fiber that carries sensations in your spine. 
and it's an FDA approved system uh, that is safe and effective and is used for the treatment of refractory pain. Apparently stimulating the spinal cord uh, makes people that suffer from um, uh, refractory pain, it reduces their, uh, their pain, uh, which can't be otherwise treated with, with, with um, uh, any pharmacological approach. Uh, it is actually rather easy to implant this system they can be implanted with just percutaneous uh, approaches or, or mm, more surgical invasive approaches. And there's about 50,000 implants every year. And then the people would carry the stimulator with them under their skin. It wouldn't even be uh, seen um, forever. Uh, now, um, what happened uh, in the early 90s and then in a subsequent of study, is, which I also participated to, uh, is that when people started applying stimulation by random uh, chance uh, on people that had motor disorders, they discovered that the delivery of electrical stimulation to the spinal cord was improving their motor control. And since those first pioneering observation, a lot of strides has been taken to do things like this. This is a, a video from a clinical trials of my friends and colleagues in Switzerland. Uh, this is a, a person with spinal cord injury that wouldn't be able to walk and with an implanted spinal cord stimulator is actually able to walk over ground with minimal support. Uh, so these new results have been reproduced all over the world and uh, have shown us that it's true that the delivery of these electrical pulses to the spinal cord allow people that have paralysis in consequence of spinal cord injury to immediately recover their uh, motor abilities of the legs, meaning that if you turn a simulation on, they can immediately move their limbs and actually, more surprisingly, uh, when this, in, this stimulator is implanted over a long period of time, uh, they're actually uh, capable of recovering motor control. Um, so, for example, um, um, this is Asia A, A, I, S, A, B, and C, is international classification of the severity of spinal cord injury. So, people with ASA are very um, severe and C are less severe. They are sensory motor incomplete. So, well, what was surprising is that across the clinical trial that have been running in the whole world uh, using this technology, uh, every person that was implanted with this stimulator with spinal cord injury was capable of uh, uh, walking over the treadmill or standing or moving single joints uh, when the stimulation was on. And more surprisingly, uh, after some time, uh, these people kept this implanting for, for example, more than six months, certain individuals and particularly those with incomplete lesions uh, show the uh, remarkable ability to recover movement capacities in completely paralyzed limb even without stimulation so when the stimulation was turned off they were still able to stand to join movement to move certain joints and to activate muscles of leg of uh, legs that were completely paralyzed before so what this told us is that uh, uh, this this technology? Well, it was approved to spinal, use of spinal cord stimulation. I mean, it is it is right now being tested for that, but it could actually represent a viable strategy for stroke as well, especially because contrary to spinal cord injury, stroke occurs in the brain and transects specific pathways that connects the brain to your spinal cord. But the majority of those pathways stays there. So. Because we see that in people that have incomplete spinal cord injury, so they have a lot of this spared connection, spinal cord stimulation is working so well, uh, we can think that possibly it may be a therapy also for stroke and so reach out a much, lar much larger uh, US population. Now, the problem with that is that everything that I showed you was uh, related to the control of locomotion and legs. But as I told you since the beginning, uh, the biggest problem for stroke and in general for paralysis, in fact, is arm and hand control, which, as you can imagine, is what uh, really makes us independent and, and also it distinguish humans from all other animals. Uh, so what about what about that? Can we actually use this technology for this? So uh, in the years uh, prior to coming to uh, Pittsburgh, um, I uh, worked in a primate facility in, uh, in Switzerland where I tested this concept. So here you can see um, a cervical spinal cord of the monkeys. Uh, 
which is extremely similar to the one of humans, uh, where we develop this uh, this array uh, of electrodes, which we place between the vertebra T1 and C5, uh, like I said, between the bone and the spinal cord. So this electrode is capable of stimulating uh, the, the region of the spinal cord that is controlling the arm and hand. So the results that we obtained uh, where uh, uh, this that I'm showing you. So with the stimulator, you're, we are capable of producing shoulder abduction movement, elbow extension movement, which is particularly important in stroke since people can't extend uh, the limbs and even uh, hand grasp movements. So that means that uh, in, a, in an animal model that is extremely close to human, uh, both for um, um, neurological and anatomical considerations, we were able to actually reactivate shoulder, elbow and hands uh, with a single a simple device that could be easily implanted in the spinal cord. Uh, so that uh, gave us a lot of confidence um, to move straight away uh, to humans. And so thanks to the support of my uh, main clinical collaborators, Dr. Peter Gerson, who is a neurosurgeon here uh, at the department, uh, one of the uh, national leaders in spine surgeries, Dr. George Wittenberg, who is a neurologist expert on stroke, Dr. Freeland, who is the department chair and, um, and, uh, and my friend, and Dr. John Krakauer, who is one of the world leader uh, experts uh, in stroke. Uh, we designed and implemented a pioneering clinical trial that we are running right now here at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Uh, so I put some reference here in case you know somebody that does a stroke and is interested in this technology to please uh, contact us through the platform PIT plus me where we are looking for, um, for subject uh, uh, right now. So in this pioneering clinical trial, what we want to do is testing the efficacy of this technology, electrical stimulation of the spinal cord, to recover arm and hand control in people with stroke. Um, so our idea is obviously that, what I was telling you before, these two souls of the technology, the fact that the technology can immediately improve uh, capacities of movement, uh, and that's uh, how do we do it? We detect the ability of the subject to start performing one movement, even, even not complete, using sensors placed over their arms. You will see some of those. And we use that to understand whether the subject wants to reach for an object or grasp an object. And then we design stimulation patterns that are specifically targeted to promote uh, these, these arm movements. And this allows the subject to move the arm. So it would be uh, enable the subject to immediately improve strength and movement of the arm. Once we have that, it means that these people can do movement which they wouldn't be able to do without the stimulation. And so that enables us to develop a, a therapeutic strategy combined with spinal cord stimulation that allows them to improve their uh, and um, long term their motor uh, outcomes. Uh, and as I told you, we want to use a technology that is being established now since more than 40 years, which is obviously a solution that has values for patients because they will improve their quality of life for the hospital because it may shorten and make rehabilitation more efficacious and for physicians who finally may have a new treatment for this disease. So our first subject uh, had a stroke nine years ago and she had residual shoulder and elbow movement, but complete hand paralysis, almost complete hand paralysis. And here is a picture of the human, uh, uh, this figure of the human spinal cord, where you can see compared to the um, spinal cord segments where the main muscles are located, the deltoid in the shoulder and the uh, extensor digitorium communis to extend your fingers are basically spanning C4 to T1 segments. So what we did was to implant two electrodes in the vertebras between C3 and T1, where all these muscles are, and then we stimulated those electrodes to make sure that we were recruiting the different muscles of the arm. So this is our stroke subjects data, where we see that the different contacts along these two electrodes that we implanted were selectively stimulating more the upper arm or the lower arm or the hand muscle, following this ostracodal distribution. And then we uh, brought the subject to the lab, and uh, this is uh, my team of researchers, and that's what we observe on the first day. So 
if you know a subject with stroke has the have the reduced capacity to open uh, their hands. So when we ask our subject to open their hand without stimulation, that's what she could do. She wouldn't be able, of, of course, to, to open her hand due to the stroke limb. And then when we activate spinal cord stimulation, she was immediately capable of uh, uh, fully opening um, her hand uh, to the maximum extent possible. She actually can close it off also, of course. Um, and that was a, a, a very uh, particular moment because um, very emotional moment because she wasn't able to do that for more than nine years. So it didn't require any training. And in fact, uh, just to summarize uh, this result, so uh, we we place these two electrodes on the cervical spinal cord and different simulation patterns are capable of targeting different functions. For example, the hand function that you saw in the video. Um, and how do they do that? Well, first of all, what we observed is that the delivery of spinal cord stimulation allowed us to increase force. Uh, so this is the force measured at the elbow that we measured, where we asked our subject to basically flex, uh, actually this is extend air elbow as at the maximum possible force she could do. And the stimulation improved that to 150%, bringing this almost to uh, an healthy uh, individual level. And in fact, that uh, increased strength at all the possible joint of the arm and hand, even grip strength, which obviously correlated to an increase in the total range of motion of movement uh, that she could do. Um, for example, uh, there's a video here uh, that I want to show you because it shows you how it is reduced in stroke, these uh, this, uh, um, joint movements. So we are, if you ask a subject with stroke to raise their arm, uh, they won't be able to raise it too much, even though they have some spare movement, as you can see, but they can't raise it above their hand. And then just one second after when the stimulator is activated, you can see that the subject can seemingly, uh, seamless, just, just raise their arm over their shoulder without any difficulty. So clearly this improvement in strength gave her the capacity to move more, to move much more than she would be able to uh, without the stimulation. Um, and that was already pretty cool, but the thing is that uh, while discussing with uh, one of our main collaborators and friends, uh, John uh, Krakauer, uh, I was discussing about these results and he told me, uh, Marco, it's not enough to improve strength. And I was telling them, well, what do you mean? That's how, that's how she's moving. And he said, well, if strength is all there is about motor control, then it would suffice to do bodybuilding to play the piano like Mozart. It, what does that mean? It means that coordination and movement control and dexterity that we require to move uh, with the arm and hand are not only given by the strength of the muscle. There are other neurological structures that are specifically designed to make, of, uh, to make us move fingers and control and make smooth movements that have nothing to do with the actual strength of the muscle. And so we needed to test the capacity of the subject not only to have higher strength, but actually to be able to control her arm better. And I wanted to show you some of these results. In this test, for example, we asked our subject to, uh, she was blindfolded, she couldn't see her arm, and we asked her to reach for her nose. You have a comparison on the left, you have what's happened with stimulation, and on the right, what's happening without stimulation. And you can see very easily two things. First of all, that on the left, she's much faster and uh, on the right instead, uh, it's not only she's lower, but she's also much more jerkier. So uh, the uh, stimulation improved the speed and her capacity to move smoother uh, in space um, with, um, with their arm. And so we actually quantified this in a robot that uh, uh, my wife, Elvira Pionini, and her student, Erika Ranza, built. Uh, Robert mentioned her at the beginning of the talk. Uh, so it's a robot that is uh, capable of measuring um, trajectories of reaching movements. And then we tested uh, um, her capacity to reach towards these different dots in two dimensions. So she was reaching and going back. And in blue, you can see what she would do when she tries to reach this target without stimulation. And in yellow, what she does when we activate the stimulation. So you can see that the movements are much, much smoother and way, way faster. And not only that, but actually uh, uh, my student uh, Erin Sorensen got this idea to try to test whether not only she had more strength, but actually she could control it better. So uh, in the same task that we were doing before, when we asked the subject to measure um, the elbow strength, uh, we told her to create a force 
that would stay within these two bands here. It's called a roadway test. So you, you can see that um, in blue, this, this force is not the maximum force. The force that she could do even without the stimulation. But you can see that in blue, without stimulation, the trace is also pretty jerky. Like she doesn't have a good control of this low level and graded level of force, where a stimulation not only improves force, but actually is capable of improving smoothness. So she has a much higher degree of controllability over force. So it improved precision, it improved spin, and it also improved uh, force uh, uh, tuning and control. So that was uh, extremely exciting uh, for us, and we wanted to know immediately whether it would translate into something practical for the daily life. And, and so um, we got this idea uh, of testing something specific. Uh, so as you probably know, Andy Warhol, one of the most famous artist in the world uh, is native from our um, beautiful town, Pittsburgh. And uh, as you probably know, he became famous also because of these uh, uh, paintings of the Campbell soup. In fact, you wouldn't believe it, but the canned soup is a very specific object and very useful for stroke because people with stroke cannot rotate their wrist if they try to catch one of these soup cans. And this is one of the uh, most important features uh, that, that occur after stroke. So we ask our subject to try to grab a Campbell soup uh, can. And so I'm going to uh, uh, thank Andy Warren for that. So you can see that when she tries to grab this, this can, she approaches from the side and she can't rotate her wrist at all. You can see her, her hand is essentially flaccid and can't really do this movement. Whereas with the spinal cord stimulation, she can actually flip her wrist and reach to the can and grab it to to grasp uh, to grasp the, the can food. So sh the stimulation, all this in control, improved strength and improved coordination, gave her the capacity to do movements uh, that are very complex for people with stroke and that can help us actually in her daily life. And then uh, she got so excited that uh, she could do this fine force control that she actually produced also a bit of art. So this is my favorite. Uh, she uh, made a drawing of um, Italy, where I come from. This is her signature that I removed for confidentiality reasons, but she could even sign her name. You can see the dramatic difference in control and fine force required to do this drawing with and without stimulation. Uh, so overall, essentially, she was able to improve uh, a fine control of the fingers uh, and in daily living activities, such as taking uh, cans or even opening locks and do a lot of uh, daily practice. Uh, one, one thing that has been extremely exciting for us was that this is all quantified normally in clinical scale of motor control nodes as Um So we, we noticed that when we turn on the stimulation, this was the immediate effect. She increased of 13 points on the scale, which is basically twice as much as it is normally obtaining people with stroke. So without any training, just by turning those on the stimulation, she regained a lot of function. But even more surprisingly, after four weeks, uh, this um, gap uh, improved even more and um, actually even the motor control without stimulation was significantly improved. So in just four weeks of experiments with us with the use of this stimulation, even the control of her arm without the stimulation was improved at a much higher rate than what we observed in spinal cord injury. So we think that, uh, I, I don't know whether reversing paralysis is, 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 is the right word for this and whether it is really realistic or whether it can happen. But I think that we have extremely interesting data to keep pursuing this research and make it, make it a clinical reality as soon as possible here at UPMC. Uh, before uh, thanking the rest of the team, I, I just wanted to, to have a few quotes from our subjects, which were extremely important for us. Uh, the first is that Without the stimulation, she felt as if her arm didn't respond to her brain. Like she was trying to do a movement, but it, it wouldn't happen. And with the stimulation instead, she felt that she could control smoothly, smoothly the arm. So whatever she wanted to do, the arm did. Uh, movement, even movement that she wouldn't be able to do over nine years, and, uh, and it was not painful at all. It was actually present to feel the arm uh, again. Uh, 
so that tells us that it's not only about strength, it's also about uh, really being again in control of one's own body. So with that, I wanted to thank the rest of the team that you didn't see. Obviously, my wife, Elvira Birondini Dagweber, one of my closest collaborators at CMU, and uh, Daryl Fields, a resident here who works a lot with us, uh, Lee Fisher, colleague, and Jeff Bolzer at the department for neuromonitoring, all our super nice students, and in general, all my wonderful lab members uh, that really uh, work hard day and night to make this uh, life-changing research happen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Capogrosso. What an incredible presentation. Uh, we're going to begin the Q&A portion of our presentation. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can or a lot of time. Dr. Freelander, would you like to start us off? Sure, thank you, Justin. And again, uh, impressive uh, presentation, uh, Marco. Uh, really, uh, truly amazing what you're able to accomplish with the patients. And what, what's interesting is uh, obviously as you've been through this uh, and you've had significant experience with lower extremity stimulation, you know what to expect. And I remember at least thinking to myself uh, that, uh, you know, I, I was less confident that was going to work, not because I didn't believe or trust you, but just because it's an experiment. And every time that I'm a scientist also, and every time you start an experiment, uh, you know, yeah, usually the first iteration doesn't work, and then you have to, you know, adapt it or change it or fine tune it, and then eventually something uh, works. But it's uh, it's uh, it's really remarkable how how well this this um, this works. My, my question is for regarding long term effects and obviously there's much less experience with upper extremity, but with lower extremity, both in terms of human experiment or or, or laboratory experiments. Um, you know, what, what have you seen and what do you expect? I mean, going from peripheral to distal, you know, uh, like you said, the muscle getting stronger just because it's now it's able to exercise and respond to to stimulation uh, to the integrity of, of the nerve that's conducting from the spinal cord to the muscle and then going back to the spinal cord uh, and then to the to the brain. What 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 have you seen or what are you are still looking for when in terms of a long term effects of stimulation? I think this is a very, very interesting question. And in fact, I think that um, you see uh, this this type of technology does not only give us the opportunity to treat patients, but it in fact is opening new ways to study motor recovery and motor impairments because uh, this type of effects, this type of recovery were never observed before. So we actually don't know really well how recovery happens, right? Um, so we're acquiring data now and all over the world people are trying to understand how the spinal cord is changing when these things happen. Um, from what we observed at least in our trial, but also in the trial from, from people with spinal cord injury, not all changes can be attributable to just a, a larger mass of the muscle. In fact, if you see the uh, improvement in motor control that our subject had by the end of the study, uh, it's interesting the fact that she did not improve in strength. Without stimulation, she, she can't produce larger strength that she could uh, before. It's exactly the same, but she has a much higher ability to control her arm. So that means that changes are occurring inside the spinal cord, inside the uh, spinal cord circuits, and actually the corticospinal circuit. So we expect that um, there is plasticity occurring between the cortex and the spine that is enabling this changing. And, and uh, as I said, part of it is also due to strength, but not the bulk. How about in terms of uh, with the laboratory experiments? What's uh... Uh, you know, when you turn off the stimulation, your subjects seem to be better yeah. with off stimulation than they were before the stimulation. So obviously something's changed uh, yeah. in, in, in somewhere, either neurochemical uh, changes or connectivity. Uh, changes. So how did, what's your hypothesis to what's going on? So uh, we're actually doing a lot of uh, animal works also here at the University of Pittsburgh uh, working uh, on that. So right now our main hypothesis is that uh, there is um, increased connectivity between the corticospinal tract and the spinal circuit. So um, in the sense that the motor cortex finds new way to connect to whatever is below the lesion. Um, that has been reactivated by the spinal cord stimulation. So spinal cord stimulation promotes 
um, an environment that uh, facilitates the generation of uh, synaptic plasticity just because it activates these circuits again. So the spinal cord as a, as a generates feedback that are um, activity dependent and that creates plasticity and the uh, generation of new connection. But there is another, um, another uh, research pathway that we are exploring, uh, which is the possibility that this strengthens the existence and functionality of specific interneurons inside the spinal cord that tend to disappear after lesion. Actually, Dr. Fields will be particularly uh, focused on studying uh, this. So what happened to these, to these interneurons that are used to, to basically uh, shepherd, the, if you want to gate the excitability of motor neurons. Uh, so they are the controller of how much a motor neuron can be excitable or not. This interneuron seems to disappear after lesion. We wanna know whether the stimulation improves their, their viability after injury or not. You mentioned it during your talk, but what kind of uh, subjects are you looking for to uh, be able to participate in the different uh, research protocols that you have? Yeah, so at the moment uh, we are really focused on looking subjects that have had a stroke more than six months ago and that have uh, residual uh, um, movements of the arm and hand. Uh, they actually could be even quite uh, quite paralyzed and just having some movement of the shoulder. Um, so anybody that fits within this category can um, can uh, just contact us and, and, and we're recruiting to join the study. We're also obviously um, expecting to move very so given given the strength of the results uh, to actually terminate this preliminary study very soon and move to a larger multicentric study where we can recruit more and more people. Uh, very, very exciting work and I uh, can't wait to see where, where this uh, leads. Uh, uh, Justin, you want to uh, come up with uh, questions uh, from the audience? Yes, thank you, Dr. Freelander. Uh, Dr. Capagros, the first question here, what kind of stimulation frequencies were required and how does task performance change as you throttle the frequency or waveform? Yeah, that's uh, we've doing a lot of I have been doing this research a lot of time ago and we're still doing it now. So um, the range of frequency that we use is around um, 60 hertz, uh, 40 to 60 hertz. Uh, task performance don't change much into an interval between say 30 and 100. They do change and we can quantify and measure this changing changes, but uh, they don't change uh, that much within this range. If you exceed this range, then task performances degrade a lot, uh, um, both uh, below and above this, this range. Uh, second question, uh, part of that, uh, that question, is there any effect on pain sensitivity? Um, well, technically there should be. We know that there is, right? I mean, people, this is used to treat pain. Um, in our case, uh, obviously the stimulation did not cause pain, uh, but we didn't specifically test that it reduced pain either. Uh, also because our subject did not have pain, but it is very much possible that a subject with stroke that actually has pain will also benefit for that. Excellent, thank you. Uh, next question, how was the ideal placement of the stimulators along the cervical spine determined? Yeah, well, that is the result of uh, many years of research where um, previously when I was in Switzerland, we optimized these uh, uh, planning procedures for the uh, lumbosacra spinal cord and we just um, translated these technologies to the uh, anatomy of the of the arm and hand. Obviously, the anatomy of the cervical spinal cord is very different, so uh, we work a lot with uh, both uh, spine neurosurgeons and neuromonitoring unit here because to have a precise planning, we need first uh, good imaging. Then with the neurosurgeons, we see it and we um, identify where to place the implant. And then second, we need uh, uh, very skilled neuromonitoring uh, um, people, team members that uh, basically while we implant, the electrode perform electrophysiology on the muscles of the arm and hand to make sure that we are covering the right segments so that the stimulation is actually uh, eliciting uh, activity in all the muscles that we need to activate. So it's a complicated procedure. Thank you, doctor. Um, how far off do you think we are from a practical daily solution for paralysis? 
Well, uh, I think that something like the things that we have seen today could be on the market uh, be between five and ten years from now. Very good, thank you. Um, is it difficult to to find subjects for your studies? No, <laughs> surprisingly, it's not. I mean, unfortunately, paralysis. First of all, stroke is very common, and, and I mean, even spinal cord injury is not that uncommon. And paralysis is a, is, is, is a dramatic clinical condition. Uh, our technology in spinal cord stimulation is not that invasive. Um, it doesn't enter directly in contact with the nervous system, and the safety of the procedure is very high. So it's not. It has not been difficult at all for us to to recruit subjects. Uh, uh, for this trial. Uh, in fact, the procedure is similar to what it is used uh, um, for epidural uh, um, anesthesia, for example. So it's it's um, this 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 wasn't hard at all. That's wonderful. Um, how often would patients stimulation cord implant need to be changed and or maintained? Yeah, well, that, that depends on the specific technology that one uses. Uh, there are uh, rechargeable technologies today that don't need to be changed, and there are uh, other technologies that require changes every like five to ten years. Very good, thank you. Um, other than COVID, what are the biggest obstacles in moving your research forward? <laughs> COVID was quite an obstacle, I have to say, although now the lab members are all vaccinated, so that that um, Thanks to UPMC, actually, we could speed up at maximum the execution of the trial uh, because of that. So we don't put our subjects at, at risk um, of COVID. Also because stroke is a comorbidity of COVID, so we need to be extremely careful with, uh, with these people. Um, that said, uh, um, I don't, I, I mean, um, scientifically, this is all very exciting. I mean, um, all my collaborators and also with Dr. Freelander, we're trying really to, to explore at maximum as possible these things. So I don't know that I would talk about uh, difficulties, if not extremely exciting opportunities. Um, if I were to, to, to mention difficulties, that would be more on uh, how do we transition this from being a lab thing to be an actual clinical therapy? And, and that, it, that is difficult because it requires um, uh, it requires industry to jump in and take over our work from the lab and bring it to 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 fruition to to, to the hundreds of thousands of pa patients that um, that are needed. So that that is a difficult and long process that requires multiple years of testing with the FDA and so on. That that is 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 not as fast as we would want. Uh, but it is also necessary because obviously one has to go through many layers of uh, safety and efficacy testing before uh, therapy could actually go to the subject. Uh, so even though we would be able to, we, to to implant these people tomorrow, we can't because we have to perform this very long road and path that will bring us uh, to develop this solution for, for clinical use. So thank you. Uh, many stroke patients suffer from speech impairments. Could your research and technology be used to help them speak one day? Um, I don't. Unfortunately, I don't think that spinal cord stimulation can help speech because it's not processed at the cervical level, or at least not at the level that we're interested in. But um, we um, we have colleagues, actually, including my wife and other neurosurgeons here at the University of Pittsburgh that are working on other potential brain technology, namely uh, Dr. Jorge Gonzalez Martino is also one of my closest friends here, um, is working with my wife to try to find different solutions for, uh, for something like speech that requires more brain uh, approaches rather than spinal cord approaches. That was the next question, Dr. Cabergro. So what other disciplines do you partner with at the University of Pittsburgh and, and UPMC? And then there was another question about um, uh, Carnegie Mellon as well. So if you could just speak to some of the collaborations across uh, the university and other institutions. I mean, Carnegie Mellon is critical for us because uh, Doug Weber uh, is one of probably my closest collaborator and he is an engineer and, and full professor at Carnegie Mellon. So uh, Nikhil, actually one of our researchers, 
uh, is his PhD student, and we work a lot together. They're fully integrated in our team, and uh, they take care mostly of the uh, engineering control part of the project, which is which is extremely difficult. Uh, then we have other collaborators with CMU for other projects. Um, I think that uh, uh, I mean this this is the strength of this city. Uh, the fact that uh, first of all everybody wants to is very collaborative. Uh, they're very happy to also always help you. And uh, in particular, the fact that the University of Pittsburgh is so strong on medicine, biology and neuroscience and, and Carnegie Mellon is so strong on engineering and machine learning really creates an environment where these things can happen because as you can imagine, a project like that requires a lot of people, requires expert doctors, uh, neuroscientists, engineers uh, and software, computer engineers. So it, it's um, we have, we have a lot of interinstitution collaboration. And then also we are working with John Hopkins, as you have seen through John Krakauer. Um, I mean, um, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I think this is the perfect environment to do, to do multidisciplinary and multi-institutional collaborations. Thank you, Dr. Capogrosso. Um, I, I guess you sort of uh, answered our, our final question here as well, but maybe you could expound on a little bit more. Uh, what do you enjoy most about doing your research at the University of Pittsburgh? <laughs> yeah, this, <laughs> uh, being in contact with so many people, it's, it's, in, it's incredible that uh, here there is like a world expert in anything you can possibly imagine. Um, and I know I know that people always speak um, about the Ivy Leagues and so on. And I, I think the University of Pittsburgh is really, and CMU are really underestimated by, from this point of view. I think we have one of the biggest communities in neuroscience in the entire world uh, that can help us all the way from in vitro testing to, to, to clinical trials. So it's a very, very unique and large environment. And it's located in a position in the United States that allow us to quickly go and collaborate with, uh, with many people around um, Case Western, Michigan, uh, Chicago, uh, New York, uh, uh, Penn, uh, Washington. It's, it's, it's really uh, an impressive place to be. Thank you, Dr. Capogrosso, again for today. Um, just a truly incredible presentation, such impressive work. Uh, thank you to all of our attendees. Again, if you have any questions or would like to learn about uh, ways to support the Department of Neurosurgery, please reach out to me at jrm233 at pitt.edu. We're so happy to stay connected with our friends of uh, Department of Neurosurgery friends this way. Uh, Dr. Freelander, would you like to close us out for the day, please? Sure, thank you very much. And uh, Mark, a really remarkable uh, presentation and very, very exciting work. And some of the comments you made at the end is one of the aspects that uh, make this place uh, special and one of the most fun parts of uh, my job as well is really to work with remarkable uh, individuals both from the very very basic science to translational work to our neurosurgeons or neurosurgeons we're the largest department of uh, neurosurgery in the country and what that enables us to do is to, with the large volume of cases and not only the number is the level of complexity of uh, patients that travel to Pittsburgh, uh, obviously regionally, but not only that, from all over the country and all over the world, we end up seeing some of the most complex and sickest patients. Uh, they are in uh, neurosurgery and often this is their point of last return. And what that translates to is our faculty being uh, incredibly um, able to take care of these very, very complex uh, cases that uh, other places are, are just not able to do because of, again, lack of experience or not uh, having that kind of volume. So that goes both from the clinical and all the way down to the research side. I'm incredibly proud of the fact that uh, we have the most uh, federally funded uh, neurosurgeons in the country here with uh, six of them uh, as part of our department. So again, uh, a uh, phenomenal uh, uh, place uh, to be at and uh, patients come here uh, uh, to be helped in ways that uh, otherwise are impossible. But another good example is the work that I presented uh, today. This is is currently transformational and it will be so uh, in the next uh, uh, five years to the decade uh, will we'll really demonstrate uh, something that uh, will go from the research lab to the mainstream uh, uh, care. So again, uh, thank you, Marco. Uh, it was very nice uh, seeing you all today. And um, 
for our next uh, episode. Uh, we're going to take a break uh, next week. Dr. Don Yealy, uh, who is uh, both the chair of our emergency medicine department and also the chief medical officer for UPMC will be with us. He's been at the forefront of uh, managing the COVID uh, epidemic uh, from the UPMC and UPMC administration. A uh, huge amount of, uh, of uh, experience and uh, great opinion. So I look forward to seeing you all then. Have a great weekend and take care. Thank you so much, Robert. Bye.